Would you open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 3? Revelation chapter 3. Now we're continuing through the book of Revelation. And just to catch us up, of course, we are in the letters to the seven churches that were under John's oversight. John the Apostle. John who was given the revelation from Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, to write down. So that we would be, don't forget why we have the book, so that we would be blessed. Remember, second verse. He just brings it right up. You read the book and you do what it says, you'll be blessed. This is especially the do what it says part that we're going through. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Now we've moved into the fifth church that Jesus writes to. We started with Ephesus. They left their first love. We went to Smyrna, where they are heavily persecuted, but enduring nonetheless in one of the worst types of persecutions you would ever find, ever see. And then to um, Pergamum. And Pergamum being a church that was compromising on its sound doctrine with the idolatry that was going on in the city in order to be a little bit more well accepted. And then to Thyatira, the least of all of these cities, and yet the longest letter, because the people in Thyatira were tolerating some woman that Jesus named as Jezebel, and they were actually practicing pagan things acceptable in the church, brought into the church, not with the church compromising with the world, but the church actually bending to the desires of the flesh and perhaps even to people who brought in great mysteries. And mysteries are always fun, aren't they? They get your adrenaline pumping and they drive you deeper, especially all that stuff on social media, mysteries. And now they've brought the rumor mill to a high art on social media because of such things. And Jesus is reminding the Thyatirans, I'm no mystery. I'm revealing my Father to you. Remember, Jesus told Philip, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. Jesus is revealing. He's not hiding things. The Bible is a revelation. It's not hiding things except that which God chooses to hide, and usually that means he didn't tell us anything about it. The secret things belong to the Lord, Moses said. And they do. Everything else is out in the open. And it's expected by us to not only understand it, but just to embrace it. We have an art, really, in America and the Western world of complicating the Scripture. Complicating teachings about the Scripture. As if only theologians were meant to know it. But I say again, as I say almost every week, the Bible is a revelation, not a hiding. It's a revealing. And the whole term the revelation of Jesus Christ, the appropriate title of the book of Revelation. This is revealing him. It's not hiding things. It's not there to twist our minds and tie our thoughts in a knot. It's to sort things out for us. And even so, somebody reading this, even down to the level of an illiterate peasant having it read to them, it was intended to be understood. Jesus is making himself clear. And now he addresses the angel to the church at Sardis. Let's read the letter. I'm going to tell you a few things about Sardis, and then we're going to look at where Jesus is going with this. Chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church at Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. But you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Remember it. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come for you. Those are ominous words, and you're going to see why the people of Sardis really connected with that statement. Verse 4, yet you have a few, few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, 
dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never erase his name from the book of life, Ooh. but will acknowledge him, his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is speaking. Sardis was an extremely important place in the ancient world. I'm going to show you a few things about Sardis. This is Sardis today. It's in Turkey. It still bears the same name. It's in a town called Sart. It's Turkish for Sardis. It's a very small town. To anybody's knowledge, there are no Christians in the immediate area. The church is gone, and it has been for a very long time. This particular picture, what you're looking at are two things from pretty much the same era. This is not ancient Sardis that I'm going to be talking about in a minute, but it is Sardis that's just a little after the time where Jesus writes to the church. The people there are standing on mosaic floors, as you can see. This room with the awning over it, and the awning is new, is a synagogue, a Byzantine synagogue, which means late Roman. If you don't know what that means, late Roman is after 313 A.D. The Emperor Constantine came to power, and that was the beginning of Byzantine Rome, as it would be called. That's a Byzantine synagogue. There were a lot of Jews in Sardis. There were a lot of Jews from 600 B.C. living in the area. How many Jews? We figure about 10% of the population of Asia Minor was Jewish. That synagogue is 18,000 square feet. There were a lot of Jews in Sardis. And that means that there were an awful lot of Gentiles in Sardis because it was a Greek city. In fact, there are so many Jews in that city that when they read this, this revelation, boy, they would perk up but so would the Gentiles. 18,000 square feet and then some. Our whole building that you're sitting in right now from edge to edge is only 3,200 square feet. This thing was gigantic. That building though off to your right that's up in the corner there, that is a reconstruction using original parts that the Turks put together, the archeologists, of a Roman imperial palace gymnasium. In other words, it's like a huge Roman bath. They haven't finished the back end of it, of course, but the ruins behind it include swimming pools and dining halls and all kinds of things. It's a spectacular structure. The Romans had really built up Sardis by the time of Jesus, and this is one of those buildings. It's an impressive place. But Jesus is going to be talking about something else in just a minute. This is around the backside from that mountain that you see in the background. That mountain somewhat terraces down to where those two other buildings were, the synagogue and the palace, to going around the corner to that temple which was never completed. The condition that you see it in is the condition it remained in. It was never finished. It was sponsored originally a long time before the Romans ever got there by a fellow that you know by the name of Alexander the Great. And this was a temple to a Sibylline cult. You know, you've heard of Sibyls? Maybe you've even heard people named Sibyl. Basically, they're like the oracle at Delphi. It was sort of a, a goddess or a demigoddess, and that's who this temple was dedicated to. But what I wanted you to notice were two things. One, you can't see. That where I took this picture, to my back, there's a river. And in front, there's a mountain. I'm going to tell you about this river in a minute. But this mountain I really want you to pay attention to because the mountain in the background that you see had the original city of Sardis, the Acropolis, the citadel, the fortress, whatever you want to call it, was on top of that blade of mountain right there. And it's completely gone now. As you move closer to the temple, you can see that mountain in the background and you can see not just the peak, but just slightly to the left of the peak, it looks like little pointed things sticking up, almost like two teeth. That's what's left of a city wall that was found up there. This is where their Acropolis was, and it is hundreds of feet high. It's huge. 
The temple itself here that was being built is deceptively large because that's one of the bases of the temple right there. It was absolutely gigantic, and it was never finished. They were very religious people. Today, if you were able to climb up that mountain and get closer to the ruins that are up there, this is about all that's left. You see this wall. But presume that wall was about 30 feet taller than you see it there, and that you were attacking that uphill and had to climb the wall. How successful do you think you're going to be? You won't even try. It's just too secure. And that's the nature of what Sardis was like back in those days. I didn't take those last, these last two pictures, but uh, borrowed them from the Internet. But you can see the remnants of the wall on top of that blade of rock. There must have been something huge up there. And it was so formidable that when people wanted to attack it, invading armies, they either bypassed Sardis altogether or they paid handsomely for anybody that could possibly find a way up. The people of Sardis, the people who lived in that city, they were secure. If somebody attacked, of course there are suburbs around the base of the mountain. People would retreat up into the citadel, up into the keep, or whatever you want to call it. All these different words apply. But that Acropolis up there, where they had almost unlimited supplies of food and water stockpiled for just such a siege that might possibly happen. The people of Sardis were a very proud people. They had a wool industry there. You say, what's the big deal? Hey, wool is very, very important to people back in those days. You need clothes. <laughs> you got to have them. And their brand of wool was renowned all around the Mediterranean world. They made a killing off of it. In front of Sardis, there was a knot of roads that were trade routes that came through there. The trade routes ran east and west through what's called the Hermes Valley, which is in front of, of Sardis. The river that runs in front of Sardis, not connecting to it, there was a tributary that ran by Sardis, that river I just mentioned. I've got to get back to that in a minute. It's important. But the river that run in, ran in front of it has a very famous name attached to it, which you use sometimes, maybe daily, Meander. The Meander River, because it meandered. And it's running through the Hermes Valley in front of Sardis. And these trade routes that ran there, they connected uh, Asia Minor with Europe and Asia, and eventually with the roads that ran up and down to Africa and to Arabia, which, by the way, went straight through Israel. That made Israel very important. Sardis was a major, major capital city-state. It was so important. I can't downplay how important this city is in history. If you happen to get, if you're a history buff, now don't fall asleep on me here, okay? This is, this, you've got to know this or you will not understand this letter. That if you're a history buff, read the histories of Herodotus. Herodotus, very famous ancient historian. You can even get an audio book on it if you're you know, really lazy like me. and You know, just listen to it in your car. And he keeps talking about this place over and over and over again. And one of the things that he said, which is fascinating, and those of you that were here a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night when I did the, the virtual tour, or Monday night rather, of, of what we did when we came back from Greece and Turkey, there was a road that ended at Sardis. It was, Sardis was so important that this particular road stopped there. It was called the Royal Road. And the Royal Road was an ancient road that was built back in the time of our King Darius, you know, the guy from the book of Daniel with the Daniel and the lion's den, he built this road. And it ran from Mesopotamia, Susa down in Mesopotamia, all the way to Sardis. You say that doesn't sound too bad. 1,677 miles. 1,677 miles. That's more than halfway across the United States if you were to measure it in a straight line. And the road was so good. And the methodology of moving information and very, very lightweight goods like our Pony Express, as you know, which ran right through here. They did the same thing way, way back then. We're using 111 stops along the way to change horses and change riders. They were able to move information, messages, and whatever they needed to move 1,677 miles in nine days from Susa to Sardis. Why Sardis? Because it was too important. 
It was way too important. That river that I mentioned that was behind me that you couldn't see, I don't have any pictures of it, unfortunately, but it's called the Pactolus River. This will be on the test. No. It's called the Pactolus River. Why? Is that important? Because a long time ago, there were a series of Lydian kings that actually ruled from Sardis. Sardis was the a city-state, but it was the capital of a region that you hear about called Lydia. Well, I thought that was a person. It was. She was named after the region, Lydia. And they discovered in that river gold, like our river here. You know, James Marshall and discovers gold and the gold rush is on. Well, they discovered gold and there was no gold rush. They protected it and they began to extract it. And they extracted so much gold out of that river that the legend of King Midas was born in Sardis. And a real person who you may be aware of by name, maybe not, it's kind of fading as our new generations come along and these things aren't taught as often in schools, there was an old expression that was for someone who was fabulously rich, like glutted with gold. And we would say a person, that person would be richer than Croesus. Remember him? Croesus was the last king of ancient Sardis before the Persians conquered it. And Croesus had extracted gold from that river in quantities that are unimaginable. And because of that, he created the very first coins. All the coins, the thing you have in your pocket, the origin of those coins is Sardis. This is where all of that actually began in history. Sardis was wealthy. Sardis was well protected. Sardis was proud, proud of the fact that they were what they were, and they were truly the kingdom at the end of the road, the emerald city, as it were, except covered with gold, as it were. They were the city of people that had great fortunes because of the wool that they had and be able to move great information, great distances. And yet, they were also known because of their exceptional wealth as being exceptionally entitled, that they deserved it somehow. It was their destiny to be rich, and they lived it up. And so Sardis was also infamous for loose living, for, for extreme luxury, luxury that even maybe our biggest billionaires today would go, no, that's beyond me. I, I wouldn't do that. It just makes you look bad. It was also known as a city of such excesses that, well, Herodotus called it a city of amateur musicians and shopkeepers. They didn't have to get better. They had everything they needed. Remember, they were entitled. They didn't have to work hard for anything. They didn't really have to work much at all. Kind of somebody once described it as sort of the hate ashbury district of the ancient world. That's what Sardis had become. But without ever knowing it, Sardis's sense of security and entitlements softened their desperation for Jesus, the church in Sardis, because they were people of Sardis. They were people of that city. The gospel had gotten there. We're not sure by who we could guess, but it had gotten there. And it had gotten there significantly before the time John wrote Revelation. The church apparently started out like most churches, thriving, excited, and eventually became compromised merely by the environment in which they lived. They softened, and the more they prospered, the further down they seemed to slide into mediocrity. Folks, if this letter sends no other message, the church is not destined to, nor is it approved of by God, to fall into any form of mediocrity. I've shared this with many of us here, and sometimes on a Sunday morning. Then when it comes to what we do in the church, serving one another, washing one another's feet, as it were, loving one another, or even just the, the handwork that we do around the church, that 
the enemy of good is good enough. And that's where Sardis was. Because they didn't have to struggle for the good. Now, I'm not a socialist or a communist. Please don't start thinking I've gone overboard on that. The fact is that why was it that Smyrna thrived? And they were heavily persecuted. And they were under great duress. And they had lost nearly everything, hiding underground. And Sardis was dead. Smyrna was dying, yet the people were more alive than Sardis could ever imagine being. Sardis was alive, and yet the people were dead, as far as Jesus was concerned. Because, frankly, as much as I don't like it and you don't like it, and we don't want to go there, and we are to pray for peace and safety for ourselves, it's okay. Then when the pressure's on, it's fish or cut bait. You either live for the Lord or you walk away, or you you slide into mediocrity. The church of Jesus Christ was never meant for mediocrity in any form, any more than Jesus was mediocre. Because you'll hear me say this again, that the church, as I mentioned two weeks ago, is called the body of Christ for a reason. As I said two weeks ago, we call the church the mystical body of Christ. And what that does is it helps us remove ourselves from the concept of what Christ put in front of us. That Jesus has gone to be with his Father in heaven. He is there and he is coming back soon, I hope. But he sent his Spirit, his Holy Spirit. He is holy. His Spirit is holy. And as you have a Spirit in your body but you are not your body... You have a spirit that dwells in your body. Jesus' spirit dwells in his now earthly body. Yes, he is Jesus. Yes, he is in a resurrected body. Yes, he's in heaven with his Father, the second person of the Trinity, and the third person of the Trinity being the Holy Spirit. But we move, breathe, live, do as Jesus' body on this earth. And if people want to see Jesus, Jesus told the world, look at my people and you'll see me. But when he talks to Sardis, he said, you're not my body. You're a corpse. You're a dead body. And nobody should expect anything of me through you. The church cannot afford to be Sardis and go in that direction. Because Jesus said, you're supposed to be my body, doing what I did preaching the gospel, having compassion on people, washing one another's feet, loving one another in actions, not just in words, sentiment, or romance. Loving one another by taking care of each other and strengthening each other, building each other up, encouraging each other, occasionally rebuking each other in love so that we will grow and be strong in Christ. So that why? We will be a light to the world, salt to the earth. All of these things that say this is Jesus. In the darkest place in the universe, the fallen world that is ruled by Satan now. And we are the lights, the light of the world. The salt of the earth, which was considered hospitality, always welcoming people into the body of Christ, always welcoming those who need Jesus, welcoming those who have wandered away, welcoming those who have fallen and hurt. Jesus said, to me, Sardis, you're rich, you got it all, peace and safety. Guess what? You're a corpse. And when people look upon you, they're looking on the dead body of Jesus. You say, that's weird. That's exactly what he's telling them. And I wouldn't want him to say that to any church. So let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at that which made it easy for them to get, forget why they were doing what they were doing. And tragically, like any person with oncoming dementia, they didn't even know that they forgot. They went to sleep. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Seven, complete. Seven, the finished number. Seven, he's got it. 
Seven spirits of God, we have another look at that a little bit later on, but it's, he's not talking about seven individual Holy Spirits shiny before the throne. He's talking about the Holy Spirit being complete, absolutely complete, finished, seven, I have the Spirit of God, I have the authority of the Spirit of God, Jesus says, and I am telling you the truth because as my Spirit is my Spirit and He is supposed to be with you, I know what's wrong here. And the seven stars, I hold these seven churches in my hand. We read that in the first chapter. He said, I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. They've got a reputation for being alive. Now my question is, with who? Who's the reputation with? It's not Jesus. And that's the opinion that counts because it's not an opinion with Jesus. Jesus doesn't offer opinions. He only offers truth. And truth doesn't get truer and it doesn't become less true. It is exact. It is absolute. But in the eyes of the people around them, they had a great thing going for them. They had whatever size church they had. They had people that were appearing to be living active in their community, and what have you. But Jesus is telling the Sardis people, you are a dead body. Whatever you're doing, it's not what I want. Whatever you're doing, it's not of me. It's not me at all. The people in Sardis don't realize that in their grossly entitled city and in that grossly entitled church, there was a corpse laying there. It was supposed to be living and active Jesus. But they were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were doing other things that didn't matter to Jesus. They were doing something else that mattered to the community, but didn't say, Jesus is here. Jesus is doing this. Like what? Folks, I'm going to have to ask you to fill in the blanks on that one. Because we can only really guess. We have no other details about what happened at that church in Sardis. Because it's gone. It's gone as if it never existed. Apparently their problem persisted. And it was terrible. You are dead. Wake up, he said. Strengthen that what remains and is about to die. There was something that, yes, was a remnant of the church, something is a remnant of who Jesus is and was to them that was showing itself, but it would be like a great bonfire blazing, and suddenly it burns down to just one little coal that's just got a flicker of flame happening there. It's about to die. He says, wake up, because you're about to die. Strengthen what remains. It's about to die, for I have not found your deeds Complete. Your Bible may say perfect. The word is complete. In other words, you have fallen into the most serious kind of mediocrity where you think you're doing Christian things. You could paint a Christian picture on it, and yet anybody in the world could do it. What differentiates what Jesus does to, through his church by what the world does? It's Jesus that makes the difference. And the world can tell. Why are you doing these things? Because I love Jesus. Why do you love me? Because I love Jesus. Why do you accept me? I don't accept sin and neither do you, but we sure accept the people because Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And how much is all? It's all. And so their loving heart towards people was not showing up somehow. Maybe they were acceptable and accepting to a certain degree, but the coal is about to flicker out. They're not complete. In the sight of God, God is watching. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. The gospel came to them. The teachings of the apostles, you have it in your hand. It came to them. It was brought to them. They received the gospel. They heard the gospel. They were discipled in the truth. Every time you walk into a Bible study, you are being discipled. Every time you talk to a Christian who shares with you something of the love of Christ and the truth of the Scripture, we are discipling each other as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That's us. That's what we're doing. 
But he said, you remember what you've received and heard. Remember it. Remember it. They forgot. They had slowly slidden into this mediocrity. And mediocrity isn't a half work for Jesus. It's dead. It's a corpse. Because if anybody can do it, well, Jesus can do anything anybody else can do, minus the sin. But the church can only do what Jesus can do. And that makes the church a very, very interesting place to the world. Remember what you have received and heard. Remember, they didn't own Bibles. They had to remember it. Remember the Scripture. Don't just take it for granted that you've got a Bible. Remember it. Therefore, what you have received and heard, obey it. Do what it says. Obedience is not optional in the church. So many churches nowadays, in order to try and get more people or keep the ones they have, treat obedience as if it is a great option. Jesus doesn't treat it like an option. If obedience is an option, it's not him. It's not the church. Obedience? He says, obey me. Well, that's hard. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Do what I say. And repent. Because they had turned away. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come for you. Now this sounds like a threat in the end times. I believe that that does most definitely apply. The rapture of the church is coming. I read again another blog somebody put up on Facebook yesterday where somebody was saying, the word rapture isn't even in the Bible. I have news for you. You're trifling about words. So the word rapture isn't in the Bible. I don't care what you call it. The event is going to take place. It must take place. And once again, if you think, well, I don't really believe in it, I don't think it is what it says it is, I have to ask the question, do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? It's an essential doctrine of the church. If you do, here's my second question. What happens to you if you're alive when that event happens? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We are who are alive and remain will be changed and an instant in the twinkling of an eye will be caught up in the air to meet those who came up in the resurrection of the dead in the clouds and so we will be together forever with Jesus. I don't care what you call it, it's real. And when it happens, this intimates that the church of the end times, that there will be a number of churches in various places around the world that when that trumpet blows and the shout goes out and the saints rise, they're going to continue doing exactly as they have been doing without knowing that anything happened at that moment. They will be left behind because Jesus has declared them a corpse. A live church looks, acts, and does as Jesus. That's why he says, remember the message. It's grace. Follow me. Do what I said. Obey. Repent. Because we're not here to have a social club. This isn't the feel-good club of Greenwood. Though I hope you feel good. I certainly don't hope you feel bad. But may God keep us by the seat of our pants always so that we're always ready to serve him and bless others and serve others. They went to sleep. They had no real need for alertness. They blended in well with the community. They weren't diligent about watching for an enemy that was already working on picklocking their gates. Satan is alive and well. His days are numbered, but they are not up. And he is active. And I don't understand all the aspects of spiritual warfare in the heavenlies because we don't see it with our eyes, but we know it's happening. And a church that finally decides we have attained, we're getting where we want to be, and they let their guard down and slide into mediocrity, that unlocks the door to Satan from the inside, and in he will come. This church assumed that they were strong, that they were secure, 
that they were invincible. Look where they were. They were in Sardis, the capital, Croesus's city. This is the wealthy city. This is the great place, even in the days of the Romans when this church existed that Jesus is writing to. And it made them vulnerable, lazy, and complacent concerning anything that was important to Jesus. What is important to Jesus? Then do that. What isn't important to Jesus? Put it on the back burner. Man, when you do what Jesus wants you to do, you say that could be hard. The reward on earth, much less the reward in heaven, though, is amazing. Because that's when, maybe not immediately, but later on, something pops and said, by the way, when you did that, I saw Jesus and it did it change my life. And how do you respond to that? Really? He used me? He used you? He uses us? Yes. And sometimes it drives people away. Sometimes it makes people say, I don't want to be there. Fine. Hope you will come back someday. But we are to stand and shine for Jesus. <coughs> they weren't doing that which was important to Jesus. They were doing that which was important to their church, whatever that was. But Jesus said, you were not doing what I put you here for. They had withered, and withered to the point of death in their Christian love and good deeds. That much is obvious, even though we don't have the specifics. And Jesus warned them. They were about to be overtaken and conquered by a highly motivated, insidious enemy, attacking them in the same stealthy way that their city had fallen to the Persians centuries before. What do I mean by that? I'm going to reread a passage of Scripture and I'm going to tell you a story. Jesus said here, verse 3, Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Several hundred years before this letter was written, something happened in Sardis that the people of Sardis retained the memory of, but the further away you get from an incident, the less important it gets. And that's what had happened. Cyrus the Great, the Persian king, was conquering the known world, and he was doing a really good job of it. He, of course, had conquered what was really all the way, think of Alexander the Great's kingdom. It was that size, and this is where Cyrus was going. Alexander the Great eventually conquered the Persian kingdom and expanded its borders. It was gigantic. And Cyrus had moved from Iran, which is where his capital was, across Mesopotamia and finally up into Asia Minor, Turkey, following the royal road, as it were, into Cy uh, th that direction where this road goes, right past Sardis, and Sardis was a crown jewel, loaded with gold and wealth, and besides, being an important city along the way, he could not afford to leave Sardis to his back. So as he's going on his conquest, one of the major cities he had to take out was Sardis. However, Sardis knew that Cyrus was coming with his enormous army, and they were battle-hearted, and they were very dangerous. And so they blew the trumpet, as it were, and the people evacuated the suburbs of the city and took refuge up in the keep, up in the citadel, the Acropolis, which you can see the remnants of it, and it's just a smattering of what it was behind me. And there they took refuge, locked the gates, and Cyrus came and laid siege to the city. He attacked. He attacked again. He attacked again. His attacks were so fruitless that the people up on the Acropolis didn't really need to defend themselves. They were in such a defensible position, Cyrus couldn't achieve the city. He just couldn't get up there. So the people up there, very much like the time of Belshazzar and Daniel, where they're partying, not knowing that, that Babylon is, a, uh, is about to be overtaken, same sort of thing happens. They become... Very, very arrogant in their position. 
We're safe. Nobody can take us. Satan can't get to us, in other words. Here's Cyrus out there. He's not going to be able to get to us. And so all they did was place watchmen on the walls. Soldiers, yes, but they didn't put lots and lots of soldiers out on the, the ramparts where they should have been and should have been watching, showing Cyrus a, a show of force at least. But Cyrus wasn't going to go anywhere, but he was in a conundrum because he could not even achieve the walls and the people in Sardis barely needed to drop rocks on them. It was that secure. And security was where Sardis fell. And this is where Jesus criticizes the church hundreds of years later. Because that's when Cyrus puts out a bounty. He tells all of his troops, which were regulars and mercenaries, I will reward you handsomely. The man who finds a way up to the city where we can achieve it. Well, there was a Mardian soldier, a mercenary, whose name was Hyroides. We find this in Herodotus, so you can read about him there. Who set himself to watch the walls, and he watched them day and night. He was going to figure out how to get up there. And one night, as he's up watching the walls, probably in the moonlight, that's a guess because his vision was good enough that he could see what was happening. One of the soldiers of Sardis who was walking along a platform up by the gate on this platform leaned over one of the battlements. Maybe he heard something. Maybe he thought he saw something. And as he looked down off this incredibly steep precipice on which the city was built, over the walls that were built on top of the precipice, his helmet fell off and bounced to the bottom. And that's a long way down. Well, he couldn't lose part of his uniform. Apparently, there was a severe penalty if you did. So, looking carefully to make sure nobody was watching, and he didn't know anyone was watching, he hopped over one of the battlements, and there happened to be these little camouflaged handholds that went over the side of the city and all the way down to the bottom of the ravine where he went to the bottom, searched around, found his helmet, put it back on, climbed up the same route he came down, and continued his guarding, such as it was. And Hyroides saw him. And he told Cyrus, get ready to pay me. I've got them. And Hyroides led his mercenary troops up that handhold, those handholds up to the top of the battlements and took the city in one night without a fight. It fell to the Persians. The garrison there at Sardis never dreamed that anyone could ever find a way up. They felt completely safe, but Hyroides entered the unguarded city unopposed and took it that night. Here's the strange irony of history. A couple of hundred years later, a little more than that, Sardis still had their mighty Acropolis. They had actually recovered from the Persians. They were now an entirely Greek city. And now along comes a fellow known as Antiochus the Great, not to be confused with Antiochus Epiphanes. If you were with us on our Daniel study, it's not the same guy. It's the guy before him. Antiochus the Great, and he, well, he's in a fight with another army. And on his way to fight this other army, he's the Seleucid king. Who's that? Well, it's one of the, the followers of Alexander the Great. I don't want to get too detailed on this, but there were lots of Greek, the, the Greek, Alexander's empire was broken up into four parts. Okay, I'll just leave that. It's one of the big parts. And he was starting to subdue some of these city-states that were in rebellion against him. And Sardis had claimed their own independence, and he's got to get rid of them. And on his way to fight somebody else, he ends up at Sardis. And he did exactly what Cyrus did. He surrounded the city. And this time, people started looking for the way up. Because the people in Sardis apparently had forgotten that it was there. And the same exact thing 
happened. You can read about it. It's like, how do they forget? But they did. So Jesus warns his church in Sardis. It's his. It's a corpse. But he warns it with this ultimatum. Wake up and watch, or I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. When Jesus said that, the people in Sardis, <laughs> they suddenly remembered Oh, he knows about that too? <laughs> he knows everything. The people at Sardis, unguarded, lulled to sleep by their prosperity, perhaps even by their success, by their safety, a blind sense of security where they'd forgotten the work that Jesus said they should be about. Because now we're comfortable, we can do other things. They'd idled their hands. Their eyes went bad, as it were. Eyes went bad. You remember, we've taught this before, where Jesus said, if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. It was an old Galilean proverb. It had to do with if your eyes were good, you were looking at other people to say, what were their needs? How can I help them? If your eyes were bad, you were looking at other people saying, how can they meet my needs and how can I get what I need from them? They had lost their good eye because they weren't doing what Jesus asked them to do, which was take care of others. Take care of others. There was no urgency. There was no hurry. There was no problem. They had forgotten that Satan is completely unscrupulous and on the prowl and lays siege. And unless you're ready... He'll take the city. They'd forgotten that they were not immune, the church. They were not immune to the judgment of Jesus. Have you ever thought of that? The church, your church, us, any church, any gathering of believers is not immune to the discerning, flaming, blazing eyes of Jesus that can judge not only the sinful world, but a dead church. And he penetrates all of that. Someone once said this. I thought it was interesting. It, it's, it's very off the cuff, and it was recorded. But they said, what are we doing in the church? Don't we know that we're attending a meeting of spies plotting a revolution against the prince of this world? Don't we know that it's the great lion of the tribe of Judah who sneaks into our churches to meet us there? Why do people in churches seem like cheerful, brainless tourists on a package tour of the absolute? Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blatantly invoke? The churches are children playing on the floor with a chemistry set, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It's madness for ladies to wear velvet hats to church. We should be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should be issuing life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews for the sleeping God may wake someday and draw us out from where we can never return. This is by a woman who observed this in her own church and wrote it down. And I remind you, as C.S. Lewis put it so beautifully, Aslan is not a tame lion. He came to spread a good infection. And yet, we the church have unfortunately found antidotes to that. We've been inoculated with weak little doses of Jesus just enough to make us immune to his radical effect on our lives. Somebody once said the antidote for a potent religion is pallid religion. But nothing is more amazing than Jesus. Nothing. There's nothing about him that's not mighty, powerful, beautiful, offensive, wondrous. Think of his involvement in the human race. God became man, took on human flesh, and lived among us. Think of his insertion into humanity, the incarnation. When God became man, it was permanent. Remember, he became a human being so he could be killed. And when he rose from the dead, he took on a resurrection body, which our bodies will be changed to be like his. That's Humanity prime. That's our ultimate destiny, and he is not changing from that for the rest of eternity. Him becoming man was permanent. It's miraculous, and his miracles. 
more than any other miracle, his words, amazing. The things that he would not do. He wouldn't turn stones to bread or call down fire or worship Satan or refuse the cup. He's compassionate. He rebukes. He's discerning and judging. He stands alone in the solitude of himself, a man once said. I love that statement. Sometimes he's silent and sometimes for years and even in his silences he's in control and he's working. The way he faced down his own accusers and murderers. In silence and occasionally just opening his mouth to tell them the absolute truth. With no malice, just truth. The beauty, the power, the mightiness, even the offensiveness of his wounds, his death, his resurrection, his feelings towards his deserting and doubting disciples where he immediately went after them to restore them, not to push them away or punish them. His ascension into eternal royal majesty, which we read in Revelation 1. His wrath to come, perfect judgment, terrible and yet perfect. And in that sense, beautiful. How can a church respond to Jesus a person like that, God, who did that, who is like that, and so much more that we can't even begin to count the ways. How can a church respond to a Jesus like that with mediocrity of soul, with mediocrity of commitment, with mediocrity of love, with mediocrity of passion? Sardis did. And that means the danger exists for every church, everywhere, every day. Has the church become so bored with him that the church requires Jesus and? That the church requires church growth projects and giant bands? I like giant bands, believe me. Fog machines in order to try and achieve people or attain people or get people or keep them in the church? It's about Jesus. It's not about the setting. I like our setting. I like our new blue wall. Big deal. It's about Jesus. That's why we're here. It's the only thing worthwhile of gathering together at all because he saved you and he saved me, he saved us, and he made us brothers and sisters and we're family, and then he made us a light to the world and now we've got eternal life to offer them. But is all that he is so uninteresting that a pastor needs jokes and videos to live up his sermons? Satan doesn't need Christians to go away. He just needs them to go to sleep. Sardis was confident in their height, yet oblivious to their danger, that the enemy is scrutinizing every battlement of the wall, looking for a way in to the church. But as one man said, a sleeping church is worse than a dead one because it may not be recognized for what it actually is and is supposed to be by the world. It's Jesus. Folks, the church, you, us, all of us, together, the family of Christ, wherever you find the family of Christ, we're his hands now. He's in heaven. His Holy Spirit is filling us, using us. We are his hands. We're his feet, his voice, his touch, his compassion, his healing, his joy, his judgment, his love and so much more that you could add to that list. Now I have two more things to say, but I need to read you something. I want you to listen. This is a little long. It's worth it. This is written by a man who was a theologian back in the 1800s, died in the early 1900s. But he was also the preeminent archeologist of Asia Minor, British. And he also excavated Sardis. His name was Sir William Ramsey. And in his own words, this is what he said. Listen carefully. To the people of Sardis, Sardis was always the capital where Croesus, richest of kings, had ruled. The city which Solon, wisest of men, had visited. And where he had rightly heralded their ruin because he had rightly mistrusted material wealth and luxury as necessary, necessarily hollow and treacherous. 
Sardis, the fortress of many warlike kings, like Gigas. Oh, by the way, he went by another name, Gog, whose power was so great that legend credited him with the possession of a gold ring of supernatural power, or Alyatis, whose vast tomb rose like a mountain above the Hermes Valley beside the sacred lake of the mother goddess. You can still see it there. It's just across from Sardis on the rim of the valley where there's a lake on the other side. It's just seven feet short of the height of the Great Pyramid in Egypt. It was the city whose name was almost synonymous with pretensions unjustified, promises unfulfilled, appearance without reality, confidence, confidence that heralded ruin. Reputed an impregnable fortress, it had repeatedly fallen short of its reputation and ruined those who had trusted in it. Croesus had fancied he could sit safe in the great fortress, but his enemy advanced straight upon him and carried it by assault before the armies of the Lydian land could be collected. Carelessness and failure to keep proper watch arising from overconfidence in the apparent strength of the fortress had been the cause of this disaster, which ruined the dynasty and brought to an end the Lydian Empire and the dominance of Sardis. The walls and gates were as strong as art and nature combined could ever make them. The hill on which the upper city, upper city stood was steep and lofty. The one approach to the upper city was too carefully fortified to offer any chance to an assailant. But there was one weak point. In one place, it was possible for a determined enemy to make his way up the perpendicular sides of the lofty hill if the defenders stood idle and permitted him to climb there unhindered, and they did. The sudden ruin of the great empire and the wealthiest king, Croesus, became a moral lesson by a great nat national disaster. A little carelessness was shown. A watchman was absent at the necessary point, or a sentinel slept at his post for an hour, and the greatest power on earth was hurled to destruction. Promise was unfulfilled. The appearance of strength proved a mask of weakness. The fortification was incomplete. Work that had commenced with great energy was not pushed through to its conclusion with the same determination. And more than three centuries later, another case of exactly the same kind occurred. Archaeus and Antiochus the Great were fighting the, for the kingship of Lydia and the whole Seleucid Empire. Antiochus besieged his rival in Sardis, and the city again was captured by a surprise of the same nature. A Cretan mercenary led the way, climbing up the hill and stealing unobserved within the fortifications. The lesson of old days had not been learned. Experience had been forgotten. Men were too slack and careless, and when the moment of need came, Sardis was unprepared. Here's his conclusion. A state that is guarded, well, you might say church. A state that is guarded with such carelessness cannot survive. A people at once so slack and so confident cannot continue an imperial power. Sardis, as a great ruling city, was dead and sunk to a second-rate city in a mighty promise. What was their problem? We can only guess, but the one best guess that we have is found in Ezekiel chapter 16. Because Ezekiel, God speaking through him, told one of the most devastating statements in the Bible to God's own living people, people under siege by Babylon living in Jerusalem, because they too had become complacent and idle about the things of God and let idolatry slip in and let their light dim down to just a flicker. What does he say to Jerusalem at that time? Ezekiel 16, 49. Now this was the sin of your sister, Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. This is the threat that Jesus makes 
to Sardis. Wake up, or the enemy will take you without a fight. Well, finally, verse 4. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Uh, soiling of persons' clothes. They're supposed to be wearing white garments. How so? Priests, people that served in, in idolatrous temples, but also, uh, conversely, people that served in the temple of God, served the Lord, or even served in heaven, as it were. They wear white, that sign of holiness. And he says, you've soiled your clothes. You have some that haven't done that. There are a few. They, they will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. We're going to see more about those white clothes when we get to Revelation chapter 19. Because if this is something that Jesus meant to be carried over to 19, he is talking about those who are dressed in white, given to them by the Lord himself. White garments stand for the righteous works of the saints, the works that God accepts. And he puts that, gives those clothes, to his bride. He who overcomes, like them, will be dressed in white. I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge him before my Father and his angels. He who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father in heaven. He who denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. This sounds like something that's all about eternal security or not. First of all, God only knows who's going to heaven and who isn't. As you know, Billy Graham once said that two things are going to, be, are going to surprise us when we get to heaven. Who's there and who's not. And as a friend of mine once wrote, I told you this probably six months ago, but I love it. I just put it back up on my wall, a tile with a little poem that said, I dreamt of heaven the other night and pearly gates swung wide, an angel with a halo bright ushered me inside, and there to my astonishment stood folks I judged and labeled as quite unfit, of little worth, and spiritually disabled. Indignant words rose to my lips, but never were set free, for every face showed stunned surprise. Not one expected me. <laughs> A book of life was something that the people knew before Jesus ever brought the word up. In fact, they knew it all the way back before the time of Moses because Moses even brought it up in Exodus 32 where he even told God, if you're going to destroy these people, blot my name out of the book of life. I'll, I'll trade you, God, me for them. Don't hurt them. It was a test for Moses. God wasn't going to do horrible things, but he was definitely challenging Moses to grow. The book of life over in Exodus, uh, again, it's right there in chapter 32. You can read it. In Psalms 69, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. It's a statement that, that's made, of course, with the, op, the opponents of God. It's a very bitter statement. And here in Revelation, and also at the end of Revelation, about the book of life, the books are open. The book of life is one book that God will open in heaven. The other one is an accounting. and We'll have to get to that when we get to chapter 20. We'll get there. But a book of life was very simply this. It was a register. It was a census. When a person was born in a city where they kept account of who was there, that child's name, that baby's name, after a certain number of days, believing that the child would live much longer, infant mortality was terrible in those days, that baby's name would finally be entered into a permanent list that was there at the town hall or wherever they kept the records. And when a person died in the city, then their name was taken out of that book. It's a registry of the living in the particular city. That's what they knew a book of life to be. God has one of those too. If we've come to him, born into his city, born into his family, born into his kingdom, our name is put in the book of life. But when someone dies, the name is out. It's removed. It's scratched out. This is what Jesus is threatening them with. He's saying, you think you're alive. I have news for you. You're a corpse. You think you're in that book? You're not. You're a corpse. I would never want to hear Jesus say that unless it's to warn me, get right or get left. Whatever it was that they were doing there, Jesus concludes with this ultimatum and the hope 
that he says, I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge him, his name before my Father and his angels, he who has an ear to hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The end of the matter, whatever the church in Sardis was or was not doing, as a church, it made them irrelevant in this world as far as Jesus Christ was concerned. Whatever they did, Jesus could just frankly say, that wasn't me. I don't look like that. That wasn't me. I don't lay on my back and sleep. That wasn't me. I didn't die. I'm serving. I'm helping. I'm keeping. I'm blessing. I'm coming to the aid of. I'm supplying. I'm, I'm your brother. I'm compassionate. I'm all of these things. And if he's all of these things, then that is the description of the church. Because the church is Jesus' body and does what his spirit says on this earth. And since Jesus' church is him on earth, I can tell you this. He will not allow himself very long to be seen as irrelevant. There's just too much at stake. That's the warning from Sardis. Father, thank you for speaking to us through your word. Thank you for warning us, Lord. It's a refreshing from you to know that you have called us to be like your Son and by your Spirit empowered us and equipped us to be like your Son in this world to the others in the church and to those outside. And because it's by your Spirit, your yoke is easy and your burden is light because you lift the heavy loads off. And you bear them for us. Lord, as we are in this world and being affected by it in so many myriad of ways, help us, Lord, not to be deceived or to deceive ourselves. Help us, Lord, to stay on your straight and narrow path, knowing that showing you to this world, even when the pressure is on in the most severe ways, is truly the most wondrous and refreshing thing that could ever happen to us, knowing fully that we are in your will. Lord, don't let us slide into mediocrity. There is nothing mediocre about you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.